All right. So I, I just um, thank you so much for being here and welcome everyone to this week's association chat, which is your weekly online discussion uh, that has to do with everything, all kinds of, of topics of the day for the association community where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with the topics of the day, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. I'm your host, Kiki Latalien. I'm the CEO of Amplified Growth Digital Strategy Consulting and CMO of Cannonball, an app startup based in New York and longtime host of this weekly chat that's been around for over seven years now on Twitter, Blab, and now Huzzah, which is a new platform that is connected to Patreon and one that I'm hoping will provide a good tech experience for more of our viewers. And that's all I'm gonna say about me for now. Uh, let's talk about this week's topic and introduce our special guest. So for this week's show, it's very exciting. You may have read about it in the Wall Street Journal, Associations Now, or in many business journals around the country. It's been one of those types of challenge opportunities that many leaders know and have nightmares about, um, <laughs> worrying that they're going to eventually have to face them and hoping that they're not going to have to. So a little bit of background. When the governor of Tennessee signed a law that allows counselors to refuse to provide services to individuals based on strongly held principles, the American Counseling Association announced it would relocate its 2017 annual conference from Nashville to someplace else. And today's guest, Richard Yep. CEO of ACA led the organization through that trying time. And as other so-called religious freedom laws like North Carolina's HB2 and, and this, this counseling law, which is seen as anti-LGBTQ, as they're being passed, many leaders uh, of you know all types are being asked to make decisions on meetings and concerts and events to cancel, all of which faces costs, legal conundrums, and communication challenges to say the least. So today's chat is when your organization takes a stand with our special guest, Rich Yep. And let me tell you a little bit more about Rich. And we're going to get there. We're going to get there, guys. OK, to the good stuff, to the questions. Rich is the chief executive officer of the American Counseling Association, which is the largest membership organization of professional counselors with more than 56,000 members in the world, where he oversees a staff of 63 and a $13 million budget. He's worked for ACA for more than 30 years and the past 17 as the association's CEO. So he's he's seen a lot. He's, he's run across all kinds of issues in his day. You may know him as a speaker on various issues impacting not-for-profit organizations uh, that have to do, all of these issues have to do with public policy or leadership development, ethics, membership retention, and product development. And currently, he is also on the ASA Key Professional Associations Committee and a member of the ASAE Foundations Development Committee. And he was named an ASAE Fellow in 2012. Oh, my gosh. And I could keep going. I'm not going to. So, Rich, I'd like to kick things off with a question about when your organization did take a stand and decided to move the big conference out of Nashville. So, you know, the articles... It, it makes it seem like it's this magical thing that happened where, you know, one day you were faced with this dilemma, you had to make a decision, and, and by the end of the day, you decided to, to move everything out of, and we know that that's not the way that these things work. So <laughs> could you well, walk us through a general timeline of this whole situation? In articles, it's hard to, to tell, you know, really how you were watching this situation develop and you know uh, the process you were going through to try to prepare your organization for this. Sure, I'd be happy to, to share that with everyone. And this really played out over maybe a seven or eight week period. When we first heard about the legislation that was being proposed in Tennessee to the time it passed both houses of the legislature and then went to the governor's desk. What we really were trying to do obviously was get the legislature to not pass the bill and then once it did get passed to see if the governor would consider vetoing the bill so we did do a full court press we deployed as many resources as we could 
and in the end, the governor did decide to sign the legislation. But prior to that, uh, I will say that when we talk about a full court press, it wasn't just with counselors in Tennessee. It also had to do with um, many of our supporters, uh, a number of other adv advocacy groups, and that included uh, the Nashville CVC as well. They wrote to the governor asking him not to sign it. Um, there were the, the mayor's office from Nashville and a number of other groups. But like I said, in the end, the governor did sign the bill. And at that point, our board needed to make a decision as to what action it wanted to take. So our president, and I give her a lot of credit, she pulled the board together with less than a week's notice, uh, you know, to have them meet uh, via conference call uh, over a couple of different evenings. And I give her credit because she started the conversation after we gave background and everything else. She said, look, let's not talk about the money part yet. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what this issue is and how we all feel about that as a board. And as you noted, this bill specifically referenced the American Counseling Association and our code of ethics. And what the supporters of the bill would say is that, well, we're just tweaking their code of ethics because of a change that they made. However, what we know is that it really wasn't just a tweak. It, in fact, it really did challenge what the core of our code is. And our code is different than a lot of other ones because rather than just protect the profession, ours is designed to protect the consumer. So we felt very strongly about the fact that we had to make some kind of a, a statement. So I will tell you that um, in those first initial conversations with the board, they were torn not because they supported the bill, but because they felt, well, are we abandoning our fellow counselors in the state of Tennessee where we're going to bring the conference? And should we stand a, you know, as a unified group when we come back you know, or get there next year? Um, the other part of the board though said, we have to ensure that our members feel safe when they attend our conference. We have um, basically a three and a half, $4 million book of business here and is that the best way to send a message to the legislature and the governor? So in the end, uh, we did take a vote and the vote was that we relocate. Once we re made that decision, that's when the staff really had to get moving because we then had to create a, a request for proposal, send it out. I will say the first nervous moment for me, of course, was nobody is going to have any space for us next year. <laughs> But as it turned out, uh, more than 20 cities did contact us. We got about 11 actual RFPs out of that. We narrowed it down to seven, then we narrowed it down to four, then it came to just a few where we, you know, went through some final negotiations. So from the time the RFP came out to the time we made the announcement, probably about three, three and a half weeks, give or take. Um, so it, it did happen very quickly. I think as one of our board members said, given what the issue was, ending up in San Francisco was somewhat poetic for us it, yes. in terms of where we were and, and what that said. Um, so it was, it was a, a big challenge for us. And it's probably one of the biggest issues I've had to face in my you know, three decades with the association. And obviously we have never ever pulled out of a city and you know we did face all of the attrition penalties and some of the hotels were really good about working with us looking at future years things like that well you know i mean and and i think it's such a fascinating story because you know um it's it's good for your organization you have had you know you you have had an interest in ethics as they pertain to in the subject of ethics as they pertain to um, not-for-profits. You've been focused in those areas dealing with diversity. And um, so I feel like you and your leadership role were in a really good position from the start to be um, dealing with this, this challenge. What I think is difficult for a lot of other, or, you know, association executives to face is that many of them aren't as as well versed in some of these areas. And so, you know, one of the questions that I have for you is what specific steps can associations take now um, to think about these types of, of potential issues 
and to start discussing them. Because I, I think that for a lot of organizations, they're just kind of praying that they don't ever face this problem. And, you know, and I don't know that they would be as well prepared to, to handle it. Well, and, uh, you know, I think that's a great question because we weren't sure how we were going to handle it. And we, we do a lot in the, the realm of ethics and diversity and inclusion in our association. But I do think it's important. And what I would recommend to my colleagues in the association industry is that they need to create a space for their board to have discussions relative to issues uh, which would start off with a what if and mm -hmm. what would we do? And they do that kind of scenario planning so that people understand where everybody's coming from and then trying to understand why somebody responds in the way they did. And, and like I said earlier, in our case, where you had almost half the board saying we should stay in Tennessee, and it wasn't because they wanted to support the legislation. It was because they didn't feel that we should abandon, which we didn't, um, you know, the members who were, who were in that state. And I think the same thing can be done whether you're in the counseling business or you're, you're the association representing widgets. You know, there are going to be issues that come up, you know, whether it's in manufacturing or professional associations like ours. Well, you know, I, I actually, in preparation for this, this interview, I, you know, um, was looking through a, a number of different articles and Joan Eisenstadt is just brilliant. I love her. Mm -hmm. uh, read her uh, Friday with Joan um, sort of summary of, of the, the, the topic and went into the actual interviews that where she asked a, a series of questions of you and a number of other people, including lawyers, you know, and looking at looking at this from all angles. And, you know, um, she in the events industry, she's just a maven and she's always thinking about how can organizations and how can event planners, um, you know, how can they plan for this kind of thing moving forward? And so there are a lot of questions I have that are connected to that. Um, and actually, Joan's on here right now. So hi, Joan. And I see that you have a question, um, and I'm going to try to tackle them one at a time. How involved or active was the state tourism agency, not just the, the CVCs, but others, hospitality and meetings associations? Right. Well, and like I said, in Nashville specifically, um, it was the CBC that was, you know, leading the charge, I think. Um, I know that the hotels were also obviously in support of us staying and were willing to do what they could. But I think that, you know, it was really Butch and his crew that, that were taking the lead. Uh, I will also say that ASAE did mm -hmm. write a letter in support of uh, the governor vetoing the legislation. So we we did get that support from our industry as well. See, and that was another question because I mean, you're you're very active in volunteering. You're very active and, and very visible in the association industry. And so, you know, the question was, you know, what role did that play? How, how did that come into play with, with um, some of the negotiations, negotiations that you went into? And, um, and also with the contracts, I can't imagine. I mean, it wasn't a force majeure. It wasn't. It, you know. Um, right. So I mean, I mean, what kind of what kind of issues did you run into with that? Well, you know, one of the things we did look at when we were um, moving to another city was we wanted to find out if any of the hotels, for example, that we were using in Nashville also had properties in in the cities we were considering. Mm -hmm. um, so that we could negotiate if possible, or looking at some of the out years, because we're booking you know, five years out now, six years out, to see if there was something we could do around that. And I, I will say that, you know, although I'm the one being interviewed, I have a great staff, and mm -hmm. uh, our senior director for conferences, Robin Hayes, did a wonderful job working with, um, you know, not only with the hotels and the convention centers and Conference Direct, but um, really jumped right in and, and did an excellent job for us okay well that's that's you know really good to hear because um you know i know that a lot of organizations they worry about what are we you know if we if we leave this one spot and we try to find another spot even if it's open you know how are we going to face the contracts there and then so one of the questions i have is having gone through this I can imagine that your contracts are going to look very different moving forward. Like, you know, how are you, how is that impacting 
the, you know, the steps that you make in looking at future conferences and future events? Well, you know, obviously, if we could, we would love to have a clause in the contract that would allow us to get out if, in fact, down the road, that state in which the city was located or wherever, you know, passed a, whether it's a piece of legislation or took a certain position that was antithetical to what the stand is on, you know, for our profession. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it'd be great if we could come up with something like that. Um, I do think that it is really important that all of us in the industry, whether we've been doing it for three years or 30 years, really look at those contracts and try to figure out what might be happening. But, you know, none of us have a crystal ball. We had no idea about the legislation in Tennessee. What it does alert us to is that it could easily happen in a number of other states. So as we did look at where we were going to relocate to, we wanted to find a state where we felt we would be pretty self safe, at least for another year. And, and California certainly, you know, fit that bill. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you know, and, and Joan says over here, you can, Rich, there's language you can craft. I've done it and you can too. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so thanks. I'll have to give her a call. I know, I know. Okay. So are you surprised that more associations uh, haven't made the same kind of decision uh, that, that the ACA did? And the reason, you know, this is actually, I have to, to give a little background on this. When I looked on Twitter to look up um, a little bit about the law that was passed and to see some of the conversation that was around it, I noticed where another organization, I won't name it, um, where members of that organization they were asking and, and commenting on Twitter saying, what's your stance on it? Why aren't you responding? Why haven't we heard from you? And I mean, really hounding this other organization. And so, I mean, this is not a problem that seems to be going away. Right. What are your thoughts on this? Well, again, I, you know, I think one thing I'd always say is that, you know, one size doesn't fit all. This mm -hmm. happened to do with our code of ethics. This happened to do with a legislature that specifically called out the American Counseling Association. And I just happened to have um, a, a very conscientious board who felt strongly about this. I do think that, that our colleagues in the industry, because one size doesn't fit all, are gonna have to look at it from the perspective of where they and their boards are. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not an easy discussion to have. Trust me. But what, <laughs> you know, what, I, what I do think is that as we move forward, given all the issues that, we're, that we are faced with, you know, whether you consider yourself conservative or progressive, mm -hmm. you know, these are issues that are going to come up. And I think more and more boards are going to have to move from just talking about well, what are our membership numbers or what are our publication sales to these types of issues, because that's part of being in leadership, whether it's volunteer leadership or, or if you're a paid staff person. Well, you know, and I, I recently had Jeff DeConya on and he was talking about the role of foresight um, for boards and and how that's that's a responsibility that needs to be accepted as as one of the you know pillars of what they're really responsible for. And I, I think certainly this subject would fall into line with Absolutely. with just that sort of thing. So um, what was something that you did really well in handling this, this situation? I'm going to ask you to pat yourself on the back. Um, what was something that you did really well in facing this challenge that you think, man, I, I aced that one. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. <laughs> I think if I were to pick something, I'd say that I made a very conscious effort to check my ego at the door mm. so that when I did sit down with the board and we did have our conversations, I tried to provide the facts. I tried to provide all sides of, you know, what this could mean. Um, it's not so much necessarily, at least in our association where the CEO goes in and says, this is what, this is what we need to do. Here's our strategy. I really wanted to see if I could hear my voice in mm -hmm. them. And again, it took a bit of patience because they weren't all there at first, but eventually I do think they came to the right decision. And I'm hoping that it's because I showed some patience. I was able to give them the information they needed um, and, and to play, you know, devil's advocate with them a little bit, as well as to be able to, to answer all the questions they had. You know, some of them did say, 
well, how much is this going to cost? And, mm-hmm. you know, we were upfront about, you know, what the penalties could be if we weren't able to negotiate things. Um, and others were more interested in, well, what does it say in the code? Like, are they making changes? That, you know, how does this challenge us? So that was probably it. Just being a good listener. Yeah, I'm wondering how many organizations out there don't have a code of ethics, though, that has it where it's so, you know, explicit in saying that, you know, this is the kind of the kind of thing that we're not going to be able to to deal with, you know, and and I, you know, to that. I think that do you have any advice as a leader and and knowing so many different um, association CEOs and executive directors out there who are in a situation or could be in a situation like that where they don't have that that backup? Well, and I think that's the other reason why, you know, events like the ASAE annual convention and, and, you know, other events where we are all getting together and talking with each other about issues like this is important. I think that oftentimes, you know, it it may not be as cut and dried, like in our case, like you said, it it impacted our code of ethics, but there will be some things where it will be much more nuanced. And I think it's the role of a chief exec as well as senior staff to be able to understand what those things might be and then to flesh them out with their colleagues to say, well, if this does happen, how would you guys handle that? I mean, part of it is, yeah. you know, we have a job to make sure our boards are acting in a professional way as well. And mm-hmm. I think that part of that is whether you're doing board training, which sounds boring, but it isn't, it can be very meaningful, I think, um, to get them to understand what these issues might be, to get them to really put their thinking caps on to understand those issues, how society is could impact them or decisions by public policymakers might impact them as opposed to, you know, what color are the linens at the annual awards dinner? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to flip to over to um, another Joan question. And everyone, I just want to say anyone who's watching right now, please know that you can you can type in the Q&A. We have a lovely Q&A feature here where you can ask your questions. Joan asks, how far out are your meetings booked and what are you doing now for those vis-a-vis laws that may be passed? In our case, uh, we're booked out about five years, five to seven, it depends on what year you're looking at. Um, And we obviously are going back in and looking at what the existing agreements do say. Um, You know, they are signed agreements. So we wanna make sure that we are respectful and not threatening to those with that we've made deals with we've right. made agreements with um, but I do think it's important for all of us to be looking at those agreements and looking at those what if scenarios excellent so that was a good question Joan yeah she she has a lot of good questions that's kind of Joan's thing <laughs> um, so I asked you a question about what you think you did really well in managing this um, I have to ask the flip side though maybe not what you didn't do well but what you would tweak what you would what what you would finesse or maneuver a little bit differently if you had to do over again because certainly going through this experience is not something that anyone has a whole lot of ex- experience with usually and um, so I'm sure that you've learned quite a bit in going through it right I absolutely would have kept the board um, even more updated on things that were on the horizon. This one was a little hard to to pick out and and realize what was going to happen. But I think that out of all the hours and hours of conversations the board had once the, the governor had signed the bill, I think part of that time was educating the board, not only in here are your roles and responsibilities, but strategically here are some of the options we have. Before we got to the strategic part, we had to go through, okay, yeah, this is an appropriate role for us to to be taking on and it is an appropriate question to ask. And yeah, we do have a signed contract and this is what it means when you break a contract. Mm -hmm. So I probably would have tried to do that better and be more cognizant of that moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so we've talked a lot about the events side of things. Um, I want to move into the communication side of things because, you know, in managing your membership, you were talking with the board, you were talking with people on your council, you were talking with uh, staff, you were talking with a whole, a whole, 
lot of people ahead of time. Um, but when it came to communicating this to your people, your members, um, how did you go about that? What was the pro what did that process look like? Well, you know, that's a great question. And we're very fortunate to have very good consultants who work with ACA. Uh, we do use Epic in terms of our crisis communications in this case, and uh, they did an outstanding job. And I'm not just saying that because we use them, but um, I think that it was very important to take it to the next level in terms of what crisis communications are all about. The board, obviously, after they made the decision, had a zillion different things that they wanted to do moving forward. It was important for the staff and our consultants to get together and figure out, okay, how are we going to roll this out? Because mm -hmm. obviously it was a huge deal. Um, we did, uh, it, some of you saw the video that, that we did. And, um, you know, we, we had to make sure that the message we sent was one that conveyed what it is the board was trying to do. And we had to do it in a, in a very short period of time. So again, I, I, give a lot of credit to Epic as well as, you know, our, our internal staff who, who help put things together. Yeah. And I, I just posted a link. I have several links here. Um, I'm actually a little bit afraid about pinning the links because this is still such a new plat platform for us to use. I don't want to make a big delay. Now, um, I have uh, the YouTube announcement that came from you that I saw posted elsewhere. Is there another, is there another one that, another statement that you made that, that, you were that, was to. that was it? That was the one that rolled out pretty quickly um, after the decision was made. I have to say that you did an absolutely phenomenal job with that, mostly because I went through and I looked at, I was like, okay, so how was how how were the members, how was the public going to respond to this? And um, just positive comment after positive comment about the organization taking taking a stand and doing what for the most part um i would say the majority of the comments i read were you know very very positive mm -hmm. were you scared though were you fearful before before <laughs> before submitting that and putting that out there I mean, did you think that you could get all kind all kinds of backlash for the decision that you were making? Like, what do you do? I don't know how you brace yourself for that. Uh, well, I you know I read the classified ads in terms of jobs. <laughs> uh, no, I you know to be honest, I, that <laughs> is always a concern when you're going to do something that is of a controversial nature and taking a bold step. Um, we certainly hoped that it would be a positive type of reaction because I think that reinforced the fact that the board really stepped up and was a board, was a responsible corporate board of a not-for-profit. Um, I do think that there is that initial feeling of, okay, people might not like this and there might be a huge backlash and maybe nobody will show up at our conference, you know, based on wherever we're going. But we also knew, and this is also important, I think, for any, you know, association exec, is we knew how many people had been saying to us if you go if you continue and you stay in nashville we will not come this year mm -hmm. so you know we weighed that against the other parts which were like if you don't go to nashville i'm not coming um and then the board made their decision so we were fortunate but i think we did do some of our due diligence to know that it was going to be the right decision now when um you know, having gone through this and having seen how um, how effective your your board actually was, I know that it's a it's a really hot topic. I mean, we we know a lot of the same people, a lot of the same thought leaders, and um, so there are a lot of people focused on how to improve, uh, you know, the board like the boards that you work with and the processes that you should go through in developing that leadership. Is there anything that and what you've gone through that you think will impact the way that, you know, you, you already said you would have kept them in the loop a little bit more and kept them apprised of, of what was going on, even though you already did that a lot. Um, is there anything in moving forward with board development that you think will be different as a, as a result of going through this challenge? Well, when we do our, our uh, scenarios, when we do mm -hmm. board training, this is certainly going to be one of them. Uh, <laughs> You know, yeah. but I, I do think 
you know, moving forward, what it says to us is the type of training that we do with the board needs to look at these strategic types of thinking. And, you know, we all talk about a strategic plan, but we're really talking about thinking strategically. How do we get there? And by giving them some, you know, worst case scenarios, best case scenarios, whatever you want to call it, um, I think that helps prepare them for what they may face moving forward. So that's certainly something we'll be incorporating into our training. So Joan has a, another question where she asks, so was there much backlash or membership loss or loss of those who exhibit, as well as those who said they wouldn't come to the meeting because of the move? Was there, I mean, I mean, percentage wise, I know that, you know, you probably don't have exact numbers yet, but. Right. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. There are some, and I'd say it is a very, very small percentage who've said, I don't agree with what you did. I'm not coming. You know, I think more of what you're seeing might be like on our, our Facebook page, because you don't have to be a member for that. You can be anybody. Mm -hmm. And if you, whatever your opinion might be, you can post whatever you want. We don't, you know, stop them from doing that. But they weren't coming to our conference anyway, because they aren't members and they aren't members of the profession even. Um, but there, yeah, there are a few. But I would say that overall, the decision that we made, um, the support we had from our divisions, ACA is comprised of 20 different divisions, um, have all been really supportive. I, I will tell you that moving so quickly to a new city with such short notice will present some challenges relative to how we currently structure the conference. But in some <laughs> ways, to my colleagues out there, it's, it's an opportunity for us to look at maybe doing things a little differently at our conference next year. Well, and I thought it was it, it was wildly appropriate that, you know, it ended up being announced that you were going into San Francisco for the meeting. And I can imagine that they're going to be really, really ecstatic to have you there, too. Um, I mean, because it was a it was a really big um, issue uh, in the LGBTQ community, and I know that it's still being discussed online, uh, online like wildfire. So, are you being at this point? Are you being asked as a representative of an organization um, that has made this big decision to? Um, I, I can imagine that your your date book is pretty full right now of offers to come speak and talk about this topic um, for interviews and and that kind of thing well i mean there there have been some opportunities <laughs> and I, I certainly appreciate those and mm -hmm. um, look forward to chatting with you of course you know i think that um one of the things that we just have to be cognizant of is it is like i said it's a changing world and as association execs our role really is to try to help our boards navigate through that kind of stuff. So uh, we have another question from um, Karen Hansen that I want to make sure to include um, Karen. And we, we talked a little bit about this before, but uh, as far as timeline, so when was the conference originally planned for and when will it now be? Um, did the dates change? Just wondering on the timeline. And was the move before most people had booked hotel flights, et cetera? She said that she feels like that would be a big factor in decision. And that is right. that is a really good question because if it were closer in, it was already really close in, but if it were closer in, would the decision have been the same? So right. I guess I'll invite you to, to answer her question first and then. Sure. Um, so Karen, the... Uh... The conference was planned for late March. Now it's going to be in mid-March. So we're really, we backed it up just about a week and a half. So it wasn't, that part wasn't that big um, a deal. There were a few people who, nobody had made a hotel reservation because we hadn't opened housing yet. Um, I, I had heard a few people made flight reservations, but I haven't heard from them directly. And normally <laughs> I think I would have by now. One thing I will say, and this wasn't part of the question, but People said to us in our membership, what are you going to do about the people in Tennessee who are going to attend and they were just going to be able to drive to Nashville yeah. as opposed to now flying to San Francisco where it's probably going to be more expensive. And so we are making an accommodation for our members in Tennessee. We don't want them to feel that not only did they not get the conference, but now they've got to like double the amount they were paying and stuff. So we, we are doing something for them. 
Okay, and then um, I see this earlier question from Joan on the point about training. How will you work differently with vendors to train them about the ACA issues to help support you? Yeah, that again, another good question, Joan. And you know, I think that moving forward, we first of all, the vendors that we're working with or will be working with will probably have heard about this. Mm -hmm. So that part won't be a surprise. But we just want to make sure that they know that when we talk about uh, our non-discrimination statement that is included in our all of the things that we we do when we set up contracts with our partners, um, that they understand what that means. And so we'll probably be a little clearer with them, giving them some examples as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. So um, as you're moving in to looking at San Francisco as being the new spot, the, the new location. You said, I mean, there, there are some changes in the way that you're going to be, um, you know, doing the show, doing the conference. What are some of those changes? What are some of the things? And, and I mean, are you adding some things just because of the situation that you wouldn't have otherwise? Um, well, I mean, what we're doing is we're going to take the space we have, and like I said, we, we basically have 20 different divisions that are underneath ACA. Well, every division has a board. Every one of them have to have a meeting. They have to have a reception. They have to have a breakfast or a lunch. We just can't accommodate that necessarily moving into San Francisco. So we might do something based on our being one community. And by being one community, we may do an award session that includes all of the divisions in ACA or a meal function where we all come together. The whole reason for leaving Nashville was to show our solidarity among our membership and those that we serve. So to me, just carrying that sort of philosophy on into San Francisco will be beneficial. And, you know, let's face it, how many different plates of crudite can you eat going from reception <laughs> to reception? They're all the same. And I think even the members were starting to say, why do we do this all the time? And the answer is because we've always done it that way for the last 40 years. So this does give us some opportunities yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, it really is that challenge and opportunity. It's the flip side of things. You know, you take you take a look at a potentially horrific situation and 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 then some really really good innovation can come as a result of it so i think that's that's really um you know a testament to your leadership but also you know to seeing how your organization has been able to sort of rally together and and make the best of this. So um, there are some other questions here. I actually want to move a little bit back into um, talking about communication though, because you had touched on some of the crisis preparations and everything. I think through going through what you did, if you had advice to other organizations, and I'm not sure what your what ACA's background was with preparation for this sort of thing ahead of time, um, but if you had advice to other association executives based on the experience you've you've just gone through, um, what would you say as far as you know prep for a potential crisis? Like, what do you think should it be an annual preparation that you guys do with staff? I mean, how do you what do you think should be um, a best practice for that? Well, you know, like a lot of us in the association world, um, we don't have unlimited resources. And so our staffs are taking on two or three different jobs, as you know. Um, so I do think that it is a wise investment to go with someone who knows what they're doing. And it doesn't mean that we don't know what we're doing, but it means that we need additional help. And like I said earlier, we, we happen to use Epic and they do a great job. But I think that it is important for all associations to sort of assess if something bad happened, you know, how would we respond? What types of resources would we need? And who are those people who could provide those resources to us? We happen to be fortunate. We have the funding to do it. And, um, you know, I think it paid off really well for us. Well, I think that there's there's a lot that is out there. Um in the association space, in the association industry, where um, there's a potential for us to receive guidance and education about issues relating to diversity and inclusion and ethics and 
Um, and there's, there's, I mean, for all of these different issues that are covered in our discussion today, but do you think that there's enough out there, enough education? Um, I mean, we're both very active in the a ASAE and I, I, you know, I'm thinking about when I go to conferences and when I, when I look at what's available education wise, is there, you know, is there more we should be doing as an industry where we're providing more insight and education to association executives and industry vendors on this type of topic? Right. And, you know, you're hitting it right on the head. Not only is it for all of us who are in the association business relative to how do you deal with the crisis, but it's how you deal and work with your vendors as right. well. And how do you get them up to speed on what it is we may face and decisions we might have to make that will directly affect them? Mm -hmm. So I think that all of the, the various workshops and conferences we go to, you know, it always has a lot of good information for us. But I do think that it's time that we need to look at these social issues that could also have an impact on us and not only how it affects our bottom line, which it does, mm -hmm. um, but also looking at what the advantages you can gain by making sure that your board and your staff and your vendors are in sync with with where you are mission wise absolutely mm. okay um and Mora, she has this uh really great uh question down here let me show it do you have a sense of when it's reasonable to take such a stand is it just when it directly relates to your members profession or are there other times i added the last part myself <laughs> right. uh, that's it. Maura, I think that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I think that it depends. The answer is it depends. Um, we just happen to have an association where the profession felt strongly about their, their code of ethics. But there have been other issues that come up over the years in terms of like years and years ago, it was uh, with Arizona because they hadn't passed the Martin Luther King holiday. Um, mm -hmm. There were other issues before my time at ACA where it had to do with the Equal Rights Amendment. Mm -hmm. So it really, like I said earlier, it's one size isn't going to fit all. I think every association needs to know what their personality is because every board and every, every associ association does have its own personality and trying to figure out what are the really important things to them. Um, so in this case, it did affect our membership and more importantly, it, it affected those who might be able to receive counseling services. So ours was a little more black and white than if it were something that were, was not directly, you know, affecting our members or our clients. Hmm. Good question though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, I don't know, I, I find this subject absolutely fascinating and the fact that you have have and are in the midst of going through it that's the thing is that you know you made the announcement you you made the leap and so far so good and it's like yes you know yeah. it's it's coming really well so far um but as you're moving forward as you're continuing to prepare for the upcoming conference and you're still managing and navigating uh with the members who are continuing to respond to you and ask you questions um what is your what is your plan for ongoing communication on this front look like you know what is your plan for moving forward because it's not like you're just dropping it and letting you know and moving on i'm sure that this is you know you're playing the long game and what does that long game right. entail well there's a great question there are a couple of things we need to do first of all we need to reinforce our support for our members who do live in tennessee and right. we're continuing to do that through advocacy and training and doing what we can to help them repeal the law that was was enacted. Um, in terms of our members who are now going to be coming to San Francisco, uh, there will be some advocacy uh, related sessions that they need to know more about so that when they are at the front lines and they're hearing about legislation or some policy that might be um, brought up that they either let us know or they help um, galvanize their membership at the local level. So one of the residual like sort of things that came out of this, one of the benefits was that it made our people who are involved in public policy or even thinking about things in public policy, it, it sort of upped their game as well. 
so there were a lot of things that came out of it that helped us realize um, how we can improve on the services that we provide and the types of support we provide. It's not something we had even planned on, but certainly something that we'll take advantage of moving forward. Fascinating. That's really, I mean, it's interesting to see how your or organization can really grow from this. Yep. And um, it'll be interesting, I think, further down the line to see how this impacts things like your membership, because I think in providing different types of opportunities and education and things related to it, it'll be, I don't know, it should, and I'm sure that the membership is buzzing, like absolutely ACA is alive and well and making these decisions that really impact their profession and they're seeing it in action. Right. So, I mean, absolutely phenomenal time to, to be able to witness that, I'm sure. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it was, like I said, it was challenging, obviously, from a number of fronts. <laughs> but I do think that it's making, and this is going to sound hokey, but I think it's making us emerge as a stronger and more unified organization. I think it brought the board together. There are a lot of divergent views on our board, but I think this is one where they had to come together and they, they yeah. did. They talked it through. They deliberated, they discussed, and then they made a decision. So they were, in this case, knowledge-based. And that's something we all strive for, to have boards that are knowledge-based. Well, thank you so much for, for answering a number of questions that you had no preparation for on <laughs> my side. I didn't send these to you ahead of time. So, um, but I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Are there any final words that you would have to say to association executives that are out there and they're saying, you know, I've, I've just listened to everything you had to say, Rich, and I'm still going to go home and pray that this never, ever is something that I have to deal with. Any advice? Well, certainly that praying is a good thing, but <laughs> you also have to be aware that this stuff happens. Yeah. And how yeah. will you prepare for it? How will you work with your staff to make sure they're prepared for it? And more importantly, is your board in a position to decide what to do when a crisis hits. All right. But I, I appreciate the fact that you've allowed me to, to chat with you today. Well, I appreciate it too. And you're welcome to come back anytime. Everyone, okay. I am so, I am so thrilled that we had this opportunity. Thank you for joining us, everyone, for this week's association chat. I want to especially thank our guest, Rich Yep, for lending us his time and expertise. And if you are located in Minneapolis. I'll be speaking at a couple of great sessions there for Ashes Connect Conference on Friday this week. If you're around, come say hi. If you're in DC, there's a happy hour for association professionals and the industry folks who love them on July 19th at 5.30 at Blackfin DC. And I will share the URL for that. Um, also, if you haven't already, please join us on the association Facebook page. It's a Facebook group for association chat, and you can fill out the survey there for ideas on topics and speakers for upcoming chats. I hope that you've had a wonderful time with this chat and learned something that will help you now or in the future. Um, if you like us, please consider sharing this chat with your colleagues and give us some love on social media. And as always, have a great week, everyone and see you next time.